Hi there, and welcome back to Art, Architecture, and the Politics of Grandeur in the Age of Louis XIV. Nice to have you back. Down here? So let's talk about the painting of Louis XIV. If you look to the right, you'll see there's a very similar painting of a younger man in the exact same pose, pretty much. And this is also done by Rigaud in the same year, 1701. And this painting is of Philip V, who is king of Spain and also Louis's grandson. The portrait of Louis was originally intended as a gift for Philip, but once it was done, Louis liked it so much and the court admired it so much that he decided to keep it for his official court portrait and send his grandson a copy. You also notice that the two men have somewhat different styles. Louis's tastes always tended a little more toward the flamboyant. Uh, and although Philip's outfit is a lot more understated and severe, uh, it does speak to a, a kind of understated wealth. Madrid was the fashion capital of Europe at the time, and the black dye that was used to color this outfit came from logwood imported from Mexico, which was a Spanish possession. So it does uh, speak to Spain's power as a colonial entity and also just was very expensive. And since Spain had a monopoly on this dye, it brought a lot of money into their treasury. Louis did add one thing to uh, the option, the list of fashion options, which is the idea of seasonal wear. Uh, Louis came up with the idea of wearing lighter fabrics in the summer and heavier fabrics in the winter. I think somebody would have come up with that earlier, but it was him. Seems like Rigaud had kind of a fondness for this pose, uh, but really there is a certain symbolism to this stance that we're going to get into a little later. But I do have to admit that the two side by side is a little bit kind of unintentionally funny because it looks like Rigaud just kind of took a Louis head and glued it onto another body double or something. In any case, this does show Louis uh, in another guise as the commander in chief of the armed forces. Although we don't really know if Vulcan was the one who made his armor or not. No one would ever dream of turning their back on the king in his presence. Similarly, no one would dream of turning their back on this portrait of the king, even if the king weren't present. It just was not done. Once you had your audience with the painting, uh, you were expected to exit backwards. You also notice that Louis is kind of perched up a little bit, and this gives him an air of looking down on us. Uh, so it adds to his regal presence, but also it gives him a little bit of uh, height because he was rather short of stature around five foot three or five foot four. Double peaked wigs like this uh, were all the rage during Louis's reign. He introduced the style actually because he, uh, following the footsteps of his father, Louis XIII, was going bald. Uh, wigs, as you probably know back then, were not just for covering male pattern baldness. They had other functions as well. For instance, if you were losing your hair and had sores from syphilis, you might wear a wig. Very often people shaved their body hair because they had lice. That was pretty common back then. So that was another reason to wear a wig. The bigger your wig was, the more expensive. Hence, to this day, we still use the term big wigs to denote someone of importance. A lot of wigs were uh, powdered, but not as often as people think. Mostly they were left natural. Uh, the one, one thing about wigs that's interesting is that they did lead to a habit more of carrying your hat under your arm, almost like an accoutrement rather than wearing it on your head. I guess so as not to get, you know, wig hat hair. One thing we normally associate with kings and queens, emperors and empresses, is their crown. In this painting, you'll notice that Louis's crown is not on his head. It's off to the side, sitting on a cushion. Elizabeth I of England also had her crown off to the side in a lot of her official portraits, but in her case, it was a sign of her uh, role as a servant of the English people. I can't imagine Louis having that kind of humility, so I just have to kind of assume his crown is off on the side because he couldn't fit it over that big old wig he had on his head. The shoes, let's talk about the shoes. Uh, clearly, Louis is wearing heels to make himself look a little taller. There was a rule at court, however, that your head could never be higher than the king's. So imagine with exceptionally tall people, this might have created a problem at times. 
uh, only certain nobles were allowed to wear the red heels. And sometimes you would see portraits where they were kind of contorted into all kinds of weird position, uh, positions to show they had these heels on. The red dye came from cochineal. This was a red dye that came from Mexico. Once again, Spain had the monopoly on it. And it was made from little red bugs that hung out on cactuses. And uh, since Spain had the monopoly on this new world red dye, which the Native Americans were already using, they were able to break the Italian monopoly on red dye uh, that had been held previously. You could not wear your red heels at court if you were out of favor. Uh, fortunately, there were people roaming around the palace who would sell you a pair of fake ones if need be. But I imagine you probably didn't wear them when Louis was around. It's also thought that maybe Louis XIV liked red heels because they were reminiscent of battle, you know, a very kind of bold and statement kind of color. The way Louis has that cape uh, sort of thrown back over his shoulder also gives him a lot more volume and a lot more presence. But at the same time, it shows off the expensive ermine lining of the cloak. Uh, ermine, by the way, is normally associated with royalty because legend has it that an ermine would rather die than have its fur soiled. So they became associated with moral purity that I guess royalty wants people to believe they have. Not even the king wore a lace cravat every single day. Uh, this was reserved for special occasions. Uh, so Louis really is dressed in his Sunday bestest here. But on a daily basis, you did see a cravat uh, worn both by men and women at court called a Steinkirk. And uh, it was loosely tied around the neck and very often the ends were stuffed into a buttonhole in your waistcoat like you see here. It was named for the soldiers of the Battle of Steenkirke, which the French won. It was in 1692, and it was part of the larger Nine Years' War. And uh, the story goes that the soldiers were so busy fighting, didn't have time to properly tie their cravats, so they just did the best they could, and later this fashion took off at court as well. If you've ever been on the New York subway, you know how obnoxious this elbow is. This is called the Renaissance elbow, and that terminology was coined by Jonith Spicer, who's a curator of broken Renaissance art at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. The Renaissance elbow you see in a lot of classical portraits, and it is a sign of rank and arrogance, and it really does jut out of the canvas and stick right out in your face. It was also a way uh, to show the artist's skill at depicting extremely foreshortened limbs. The little white shorts that Louis has on are called trunk hose, and they show his very muscular and athletic legs to their best advantage. In truth, Louis wasn't quite in as good shape as he is depicted in the painting. But in his youth, he was very strong, very athletic, and considered a great dancer. He used dance steps and knowing the latest dance routines as a way to intimidate his courtiers, uh, as well as etiquette. They were so busy learning the intricacies of how to deport themselves at the court that they were too busy to think of things like, oh, how do we overthrow the king? So Louis really did use it as a method of control. Earlier on, we were comparing Louis XIV's outfit to Philip V's outfit. And in fact, what Louis has on in this picture is a little bit dated. By this time, knee breeches were more in style, which we're going to point out very shortly. Uh, however, Louis does make one concession to fashion in that his doublet, in other words, what he's wearing on top here, on top here, this is his doublet, and his trunk hose do match in fabric. So that is a more uh, something of a concession to more current fashion. All you fashionistas out there need to take note of this important date. Uh, we are looking at Charles II. He is the newly restored King of England and he spent his exile in France. He's Louis XIV's cousin. And when he came back to England, he wanted to be seen as very sober, very somber. So he adopted this very understated mode of dress, a lot less flashy colors. He wanted to break England away from any kind of dependence on French silks and uh, wanted to support the English wool trade, did not want to be seen as a spendthrift Louis XIV coming back to England so he added 
for all these reasons, a vest to the outfit of what was called a justo corpse, which is the waistcoat he's wearing and a pair of knee breeches. This is the word itself. Where is my little arrow down here? There we go. This is justo corpse. Uh, it is from the French word juste au corps, which means tight to the body. Louis did adopt the uh, three-piece suit look for everyday wear, although of course you can see he did put his own spin on it. His taste in coronation wear though did stick around for a while. Here you see his heir, Louis XV, his great grandson, uh, wearing the same trunk hose and doublet kind of ensemble. And here you see it on Charles X, who was crowned in 1825, the same doublet and trunk hose look. I don't think I like the way this guy is looking at me. The idea of making oneself look larger by wearing big shoes and big hair goes way back. This is a Roman actor wearing what are called cotherni. These are the boots that actors in Greek and Roman tragic plays wore to make their characters look larger in life. And you see he kind of matches it with a headdress up top. And this is how you spell cotherni. And here I am on stage with rock band Kiss, showing that the big shoes and big hair look may never, ever go out of style. I actually hear Kiss is going to retire pretty soon, so if you want to catch him, you better hurry up. Anyway, so that's the end of part one. And once again, this is my book, The Art of Look. Well, let me move me over. Come on. I can't be over there. Look. Where do I put me? I don't know where to put myself. Anyway, okay, this is my book, The Art of Looking at Art. I'm going to... There, there we go. I'll just sit there with these guys. Uh, and it's uh, available all over the internet. You can find it easily. And should you want to get in touch with me, there is my email, gene at genevizhnevsky.com, my website where you can see my work, genevizhnevsky.com. And my current and upcoming classes are all listed at the six hour art Thanks for coming to part two. Hope to see you at part three.